Good day, folks, and welcome back to the channel. So where'd you get all this? I've been collecting since I was young, actually. There's roughly a thousand pieces, almost 600 of them in boxes. Everything is pre-70, which is considered the most collectible because in 70, Matchbox changed their whole way of manufacturing due to Hot Wheels being released. So what do you want to do with these? I'm hoping to pawn them. Okay, uh, how much were you looking to get? I'm hoping to get 20,000. Today, we'll show you the best of the biggest loan moments on Pawn Stars. What is that? That's the dunk corner. Holy sneakers. So what's so special about these, Chum? I mean, you got the what the dunks, you got the Supreme Collection, you got the Huffs, you got the Diamond Tiffany Blues. Everything's here. OK. What's your most expensive pair of dunks here? This pair right here is worth about $5,000. So what do you want to do with all these shoes? I want to sell them. How much do you want? A million dollars. A million dollars for shoes. A million dollars for 2,000 shoes. Matchbox Toy. Chris brought in his vintage Matchbox car collection spanning 1953 to 1969, with nearly 1,000 pieces and around 600 still in boxes. I've got almost every single car that Matchbox put out between 1953 and 1969. I came down to the pawn shop today to pawn my collection of vintage Matchbox. I'm in need of temporary cash flow. I am looking for $20,000. Oh, I'm very confident that taking this loan that I will pay it back. So where'd you get all this? I've been collecting since I was young, actually. There's roughly a thousand pieces, almost 600 of them in boxes. Everything is pre-70, which is considered the most collectible because in 70, Matchbox changed their whole way of manufacturing due to Hot Wheels being released. Seeking a $20,000 loan, Chris believed his collection was valuable. So what do you want to do with these? I'm hoping to pawn them. Okay, uh, how much were you looking to get? I'm hoping to get 20,000. I don't know enough about this stuff to just shell out 20 grand. Right. But my buddy Johnny will know. So let me get him down here, have him go through all these boxes, and maybe we'll get something done. Rick consulted toy expert Johnny, who appraised it at $25,000 to $28,000. What's going on? This guy wants to pawn all of his Matchbox stuff. He's got like thousands of cars and pieces here. So I was hoping you could maybe go through it for me. Yeah, no problem, man. The Matchbox came out in the late 40s. And they were really popular because they had a lot of detail, a lot of moving parts, opening doors. There was virtually no competition up until 68 when Hot Wheels released their first 16. They made two to 300 of these pieces when they coronated uh, Queen Elizabeth. This is a really, really rare piece. You got the BP tanker with the gray wheels. Also, you got some of the king size pieces here. You have some jewels in these boxes here. So what are your questions about this collection? What's it all worth? And everything's pretty mint. And it's a pretty complete collection. Collection, I would put a price in the collection at 25 to 28 grand on the whole collection. Though so Chris insisted it was worth 75,000. Uh, I'd have to uh, disagree with that. All right, what do you think it's worth? I put it at 75,000 myself. Thanks, Johnny. You're the best. Appreciate it, buddy. No problem, man. Despite Corey's warnings about the loan, Chris remained determined. All right, my man, you're looking for a $20,000 loan. I've got no problem giving it to you. You gotta understand, man, my typical loan is 100 bucks. I strongly suggest you do not take a $20,000 loan. So what do you wanna do? I need the 20. It's uh, not what I want, it's what I need. However, the deal fell through, and Chris left with his cherished Matchbox collection. While Chris hoped for the loan, he understood the risks. In the end, preserving his collection meant more to him than securing the loan. Despite the difference in valuation, Chris departed the pawn shop with his vintage cars and a lesson in the uncertain world of collectibles. Big Dog Custom Chopper On Pawn Stars, a man brought in his impressive Big Dog Custom Chopper, seeking a significant loan. Yeah, it's a hot bike, man. I'm coming to the pawn shop today to pawn my motorcycle because my business is in the auto industry and the auto industry is doing really poorly. He explained his financial troubles in the auto industry and urgently needed $20,000 to cover payroll. So I gotta ask, man, why would you pawn a bike like this? I gotta make payroll. I got employees that count on me, you know? Before he outlined the pawn process, where something valuable is exchanged for cash with interest. Pawning is basically the simplest form of credit. You give us an item that we take as collateral, and then we'll give you cash. You pay us back our money with interest, and you get your item back, simple as that. So what are you looking to get out of it? I need to get 20 grand to make payroll. 20 grand, that's gonna be rough on it though, man. It's a nice bike, man, but we're looking around eight. 8,000, dude, I can't, I ain't gonna cut it. Uh, I'll tell you what, man, I'll meet you in the middle at 15 if it helps you out. After negotiation, they settled on $15,000 with a 120 day redemption period. Corey cautioned that failing to repay would mean losing ownership. With no better options, the man reluctantly agreed, 
hoping to gather the funds before the deadline. How long do I have till I can get it back out? You can get it back out tomorrow if you want. But I mean, you got 100. No, but I mean, like, I had 120 days. Yeah. And what happens after 120 days if I don't come get it? You'll see me riding this bike down the street, man. All right, I'll do the deal. I got to make payroll. All right, let's go back inside and write it up. It marked one of the biggest loans made on the show, highlighting the challenges people face and the tough decisions they must make during financial struggles. 2001 Super Bowl Championship Ring. In this episode, Rick shared an unexpected story about the first Patriots Super Bowl ring. Despite dealing with many Super Bowl rings, his 2001 Patriots ring remained unique. The joke had always been, one of these days I'm gonna rip open one of these envelopes and the Holy Grail is gonna fall out. It did. We're at the world famous Golden Silver Pawn Shop on the fabulous Las Vegas Strip. Believe it or not, I have pawned hundreds of Super Bowl rings, but they always pick them up. The very first one I ever actually got to own, that's my 2001 Patriot Super Bowl ring. Its previous owner, Brock Williams, pawned it in Vegas for $2,600, needing cash. Brock Williams, he pawned the ring, he didn't sell it, okay? He was in Vegas, and we know what happens in Vegas. He needed cash, so I think the guy in the night shift actually offered him 10000 but he only wanted 2600 because it's a lot less expensive to pick it up that way. I mean, he, I'm sure he more than planned on picking it up, but then weird things happen in this world. What you don't see on my television show is most people just come down here to get loans. You know, I would loan them money, and then they will come back later and pay me back the money I loaned them plus some interest. We'd give people 141 days to pick up their merchandise. And after that, you know, every morning, there's a thing called the defaults. These people loans people didn't pick up, um, they defaulted on it, it's now my property. Rick, unaware of its significance, rediscovered the ring while handling default items. There's envelopes I'd have to go through, and I opened one up, and I just poured it out of my desk, and it made a big clunk, and I'm going like, you got to be kidding me. So this was the start of the super blingy Super Bowl rings. Okay, your first Super Bowl ring is only supposed to be 10 carat. It's only supposed to weigh so much. It's only supposed to have so much in diamonds. Well, Kraft apparently says, this is our first Super Bowl win. I'm gonna make the damn ring any way I want. The flashy 14 karat white gold ring, adorned with 143 diamonds, sapphires, and rubies, tempted Rick with a potential $100,000 sale. Although it was valued between $25,000 to $40,000. To me, it's one of the coolest Super Bowl rings there ever was. It's 14 karat white gold. I think there's 143 diamonds, and they use sapphire and rubies for the logo. I don't want to sell it because what happens is, is someone will come in from, say, Boston and say, hey, he's got a Super Bowl ring in the showcase. He'll go home, tell his friends, they'll want to come in the pawn shop and see it. Realistically, a ring like that is probably worth 25. And I have sold Super Bowl rings for as much as $40,000. I put the ridiculous price of $100,000 on it, which is way too much money. But if someone wants to give me that, I'll actually sell it. Rick reflected on the ring's journey, recalling how most rings found their way back to their owners, while his Patriots ring stayed with him a cherished memento of his sports history, semi-truck. Rick received a call from a man looking upon his impressive Volvo truck, a top-of-the-line 780 model with a powerful Cummings 500 horsepower motor and advanced air ride features. Intrigued, Rick invited him to Wally's to discuss the deal. Earlier this week, I got a call from a guy who said he needed a Pontus truck. He said it was a very expensive truck. We really didn't go into it. So I told him, meet me over at Wally's, and I'll see what I can do. This is probably the top of the line, one of the top of the line Volvo trucks. It's a 780. It comes with the Cummings 500 horsepower motor. You get air ride on both back axles. So why do you want to get rid of it? I, I not, don't want to get rid of it. I just want to get a loan on it. I got some family business I need to take care of and uh, get back handle that. Things do happen. During the meeting, the man revealed that he originally bought the truck for $125,000, but now sought a loan of only $20,000 or his family business. Uh, how much do you need to borrow? I got the truck for like maybe 125,000. Uh, I'm not looking for that, I'm looking for maybe 20,000. Uh, take care of what I need, okay. hopefully come back, pick her up and keep on trucking. Impressed by the valuable collateral, Rick agreed to provide the loan. After a thorough inspection, they finalized the transaction, leaving the grateful man ready to handle his responsibility. So uh, while he's gonna check it out, make sure there's no problems and uh, if there isn't, we should have a deal. Sounds like a deal. Okay, all, all right. right, thanks man. Checked it out, everything looks really good. Thanks so much, Wally, I really Thank appreciate you. it. All right, we'll get you out of here now. Okay. The successful deal showcased one of the biggest loans on Pawn Stars, leaving both parties satisfied as the man drove away with the cash he needed. 2006 Dodge Magnum. In this episode, Jeff showed off his special 2006 Dodge Magnum. He spent three years turning it into an old battleship look. Hey guys, this is my uh, 206 Dodge Magnum. Built it about three years ago and time to build another one. Everywhere you drive it, people just stare at you. But now Jeff needed the money for a new car. So he wanted to sell the Magnum for $35,000 because of all the changes he made. I bought the Dodge Magnum uh, in 2006. I love driving old cars, but I hate the way they run. So I decided to buy a new car. Let's make it look old. 
uh, physically and mechanically be a brand new car. I'd really like to get 30,000. I don't think they're gonna pay that, but you know, you gotta try. Tell me all about this car, man. I wanted to make it just like a battleship. And so when we drew out the paint job, I just wanted lines and rivets, and then we did that, all airbrushed. Let's just get down to it real quick. Give me an idea of what you spent on the paint, man. It wasn't too bad. It ran me about 6,000 total. What else have you done to it? Uh, we sewer sided the doors, so all four doors open up backwards. You open them up going down the highway. That break your arm off, and it take you right out of the car if you don't have your seatbelt on. So how much do you want to sell it for? Maybe if I can get 35,000. Yeah. Corey, however, thought it wasn't worth that much and offered way less. You know, man, I'm not trying to hit you over the head here, but the car blue books for around 16 with 100,000 miles on. Right now, I'm seeing a 06 Dodge Magnum that I'm gonna have to paint, put some new wheels on. You wanna sell me the car, man? I'll buy it off you for six grand. Can't do that. You know, I think I wanna pawn it. You wanna pawn it? I'll pawn it for three. Jeff didn't like it, but he agreed to pawn the car for $3,000, hoping to get it back later. Okay, that's a deal. Deal. Thank you. So instead of selling it, the Dodge Magnum became collateral for a pawn deal. Even though Jeff's sales plan didn't work out, he stayed hopeful. He thought he might try his luck at the casino with the pawn money. Seiko TV Watch Jason, a seller, displayed his treasure 1983 Seiko TV Watch, famous for its role in the James Bond movie Octopussy. He won it in a raffle during his youth. What you got here? It's a uh, 1983 Seiko TV Watch as seen in the James Bond film, Octopussy. I got the TV watch when I was about nine or 10 years old. I won it in a raffle from a jewelry store. I got to play with it once or twice and then uh, got put back in the box, probably because I was a nine year old. I was hoping to get about $800 for it. And you know, I'd like to see what they want to offer me for it, see what it's worth. In the 1980s, Seiko was just ahead of their time when it came to watches. They were innovative and they were pushing the market just to a whole new level. I mean, Seiko had a couple other watches at the time. They had one that had recording technologies and even made a computer functioning watch. It's funny to think this is a smart watch now because it's got this big giant receiver right here and I imagine you got to put this in your pocket, walk around with it. Yeah, the idea was you hook this wire up to the watch and then run it up your sleeve and keep that thing in your shirt pocket. So you can sell it for $800, he valued its nostalgic appeal and innovative smartwatch features ahead of its time. How much are you looking for? I've seen them uh, sell online for upwards of about a thousand bucks and was hoping to get like 800 bucks out of it. I just don't see it bringing that much. Um, I think we sold one for uh, right around $300. Yeah, you know, was it in this good a condition? I mean, this is all original, very clean. It's got the full box. It's even got the instructions. But you gotta understand, as cool as it is, you know, it's just a collector's item because you can't actually watch TV on it. However, Chum Lee, recognizing its historical significance, wasn't sure of its practicality and offered $150. I mean, we're looking at like 150 bucks. Could you do a little bit more, like, you know, like 250? I really couldn't. I'm pretty much stuck at 150. At 150, not even like yeah. 200, huh? Despite Jason's attempt to negotiate for 250, they settled on 175. No, I mean, I just don't know if I'm gonna get 300 out of it. You know, I'm. All right, I'm, what I'm, about 175? And we'll call it a deal. I could do 175. All right, let's do it. All right, sounds All right. good. Thanks. Jason felt happy leaving the pawn shop with 175 dollars in hand. He thought it was a fair price for a special watch that held lots of memory. Monet painting. Ken visited the pawn shop with a Claude Monet painting obtained as collateral for a loan. The previous owner defaulted on it and passed away, leaving the painting estimated at two to three million dollars. What do we have here? Well, it's a Claude Monet painting. Okay, where in the hell did you get this? Uh, collateral for a loan. I've had the painting for three years, and to be honest with you, it's not really my kind of art. I am not an art collector, but I know if it's real, it's probably worth in the neighborhood of Two to three million dollars. All right. Uh, I, I mean, I, I know a little bit about Monet. He started arguably one of the biggest art movements ever, the Impressionist movement. There was Pissarro, there was Renoir. All these really, really great artists came out of it. So he started this. He started it. I mean, Impressionism is named after his painting, Impression Sunrise. Hmm. That's why his paintings are worth so much money. Documentation, including insurance policies, accompany the painting detailing its history. What I have here is some documentation, some provenance for you that you can look at. May 1st, 1965, our findings as as follows. The painting is solidly constructed, casual canvas, a typical Claude Monet from his early period. Then we jump forward to 1997. The painting was actually displayed at the Las Vegas Museum of Fine Arts. Okay, so you wanna sell it, correct? Correct. 
Despite Rick's lack of expertise, he sought an art specialist to authenticate it. So let me get a friend down here. Okay. If this is legit, I think we can both make money off it. Okay. Sounds good. All right, I'll okay. be right back. Oh my gosh, this is, this is the Monet. This is it. All right. Monet's one of the, the biggies. I mean, when you think of fine art masters, Monet's right up there near the top of the heap. He established probably the most important artistic movement of the last 200 years. I mean, there's prestigious museums that can't get hold of a Monet, so you don't expect to see one in a Las Vegas pawn shop. Uh, let me take a closer look at it. It's indicative of Monet's brush strokes. Impressionists were all about, as the name would indicate, you know, capturing the impressions of a scene. And when you work in plain air, out in the open air, it's all about speed. I mean, because the lighting changes, the wind kicks up, you know, the, the, the shadows move. So you have to really capture the impressions quickly. The brush strokes are there. It's, it's very thin. Usually you'll get some sort of impasto, a little bit more texture. He, he usually had some texture in his pieces. And this, again, there's very little of that. I'd like to get a second opinion, because again, when you start talking about these types of upper echelon pieces, the more opinions you can get, the better. Okay. And just because there's a few red flags that I see, he may not see it that way. That's fine with me. Okay. Is that okay, Rick? Sure, yeah. Good. Following the initial inspection, a second expert was consulted for a second opinion. Gerard is, is the man that I go to in our gallery when we have masterpieces come through just to verify authenticity and things like that. I trust his opinion implicitly, so. If this is a real Monet, uh, it will be a very important Monet because of the size and also because of the subject, of, uh, because he is a painter from the outdoors, from the landscapes. Monet is, uh, is known for that quality. The first thing, if it's a Monet, it should be 150 years old. So we should at least see cracks in the painting. Also here in the signature, there is absolutely not one crack that's interesting. Unfortunately, both experts concluded that the painting was not genuine. So is it real? It's in the style of Monet, but it's not absolutely not by the end of uh, Claude Monet. Really? Yeah. How Doesn't sure are you of this? 200% uh, sure because there's absolutely not one crack in the paint itself. So it's, it's not usual for 150 years old painting. Usually when it's too good to be true, it generally is. Well, that's disappointing. Well, thanks for bringing it in. It was fun. <laughs> this revelation disappointed everyone involved. It highlighted the complexities and risks associated with valuable artworks and their authenticity in the art world. Shoezeum. Rick and Chumley explored a storage unit housing a vast collection of Nike sneakers, purported to be the world's largest. I've been trying to convince the guys that I can find them some killer deals. So I found something that could make Rick a whole bunch of money. I just hope he's got an open mind. Hey, what's up? You guys from the pawn shop? Yeah, how you doing? How you doing? This place is amazing. World's largest collection of Nikes. It looks like a temple to me. The assortment included shoes themed around superheroes, cartoons, and rare Nike skateboarding models, valued at a million dollars by collector Jordy. Every shoe in this collection is brand new, and each shoe represents a pivotal Nike innovation. This collection's my pride and joy, but I'm looking to sell it because it's time to move on. I'm gonna ask for a million dollars for my collection, but I'd be willing to take 800,000. Despite Jordy's willingness to accept a minimum of $800,000, Rick and Chumley remain skeptical. So what all do you have here? Well, it's the world's largest collection of Nikes. It's broken down into categories like running, basketball, different themes, and all the shoes are on display with toys and props that bring them to life. They visited Jordy's storage unit to inspect the shoes and verify their authenticity. Can you show us around? Oh, I'd love to. We've got 40 years of Nike running, all in chronological order. Where Nike running ends, Nike basketball begins. So you've got five aisles of basketball. There's just so many damn shoes. <laughs> You'll never find another collection like this anywhere. What are those? Up top, we've got three dozen Oregon waffles. The waffle sole was created by the founder of Nike who started pouring rubber and synthetic materials into a waffle iron to try to get soles that would grip the ground better. So how much is a pair like this worth? $1,700. Holy. What is that? That's the dunk corner. Holy sneakers! So what's so special about these, Chum? I mean, you got the what the dunks, you got the Supreme Collection, you got the Huffs, you got the Diamond Tiffany Blues. Everything's here. Okay, what's your most expensive pair of dunks here? This pair right here is worth about $5,000. After the examination, Rick offered $550,000 for the collection, but Jordy turned down the offer. So what do you want to do with all these shoes? I want to sell them. How much do you want? A million dollars. A million dollars for shoes. 
a million dollars for 2,000 shoes. I mean, what's your rock bottom price on them? I want a million dollars. What I'm looking at here is something that's going to take me two years to sell them all. I'm going to have someone working for me for two years that I got to pay a salary to to sell all this stuff. I mean, I'll give you 300 grand for it. No way. I mean, it's cash, you walk away, you don't have to deal with nothing. No way, not even close. I'll, I'll come down to nine. Rick, don't let the deal of a lifetime slip out of your hands. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll go a half a million bucks. I won't go anymore because literally it's going to cost me at least 100,000 just to sell it all. Half a million bucks is 250 a shoe. I've got shoes in here that were five grand. I'll come down to eight. That's my rock bottom price. <sighs> I'll tell you what, I'll go 550. I can't do it. It's just too low. So Rick and Chum Lee left the storage unit without getting the sneakers showing how tricky it can be to figure out the value of collectibles. It was nice meeting you, man. Rick. It's nice meeting you, too. Rick. I really appreciate you letting me see everything, but come on, Sean, we gotta go. It's not gonna happen. You wanna sell anything individually? Thanks for coming by, nah. Thanks for showing me. This is where we'll end our video. We hope you enjoyed watching it. Make sure to comment and hit that like and subscribe button too. Hit that notification bell for more videos like this. Share this video with your family and friends. See you soon.